You are listening to the Apex Hour, hosted by Ryan Paul on KSUU Thunder 91.1. This show allows more personal time with our guests, allowing them to give us their stories and opinions. We will also give you new music to listen to, hoping you enjoy some new sounds and genres. Welcome to this episode of the Apex Hour. Welcome to the Apex Radio Hour. I'm producer Evan Miller. I'm joined with Apex Director and Professor of History, Ryan Paul, and our special guest, Cordell Taylor. I'm turning it over to you, Ryan. Thanks, Evan. We are so excited to have uh, our guest, Cordell Taylor. Uh, Cordell Taylor is a a skilled assemblage artist and constructive sculptor and has done work all over the state and all over the country in in various mediums of of sculpture. Uh, Cordell, what I'd like to start with first is kind of a how we get to now here. So can you tell us a little bit about where you came from and, and how you got to do what you do? Um, well, let's see. Um, uh, when I decided to go back to school, I, ca- I actually had been a professional iron worker and fabricator for a while. I'd lived in LA and all over the Western US working in the oil field. And when I went back to school, I decided I was going to uh, be an engineer and that didn't work out. And I fell in love with sculpture as I was doing it. And it was like all the uh, things I had done through high school um, and growing up, I was able to apply them into a trade. And I worked with a a successful artist that made me realize that I could be successful. And uh, that's kind of what got the ball rolling. So when did you decide that that this was what you wanted to do, that you wanted to be an artist and a sculptor? Oh, I was actually about 27 years old. So, you know, I I struggled for a long time trying to figure out my life while I was a teenager and that uh, up to that point. Um, But uh, I was 27. So that's been um, almost 40 years ago. And when, uh, where, where were you born? I was born up in Brigham City, Utah, and uh, my father um, worked for Thiokol Corporation up there. And so uh, the school that I went to had a uh, intensive trades-oriented high school where we learned all kinds of uh, different fabrication techniques and uh, materials and things like that. So that so, was the influence. So when you say fabrication techniques, what, what does that mean? Um, well, like plastics fabrication, like uh, fiberglass and graphite plastics, Lexan or plexiglass, um, resins, and those types of things because they were all space oriented uh, because um, Thiokol Corporation, of course, was where Saturn V1 rockets and Apollo engines and those kinds of things were developed. Now, I'm I'm not sure what the uh, STI or something like that is what they they call it up there now. But um, and so it was all things related to the space industry. And and you left school and went to work in the oil fields. Is that correct? Yes, there was a big oil boom going on in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. And um, uh, it it was very lucrative and there was a lot of money in it. And um, since I had all the trade welding, welding and those types of things behind me, it was very easy to step into a really good paying job um, that, uh, um, you know, uh, back then, and this is in the 70s, that was like uh, $40,000 a year. And my rent was like $125 a month. It's not the same today. <laughs> no, especially in Salt Lake, I think, where you where you currently live, right? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, no, it's, it's skyrocketing. Yeah. So I, I think it's interesting, the words you use, I mean, like we always think of, well, Cordell Taylor, he's an artist and a sculptor, but you say an assemblage artist and a constructive sculptor. Can you, can you define those terms for us? Well, <clears throat> um, assembly is when you, you bring together uh, different things to uh, create an end product. And a uh, construction or constructivist side is when you basically design and build a work or or artworks um, from basically nothing, from starting with drawing and, and then you're choosing the material and, and uh, determining the result, the result or the end result. So this may be like the, a chicken and the egg question, but does, does the inspiration, do you, do you say, oh, this is what I'm inspired to make? Or do you see material and say, I could make something out of this or both? Um, it's both, both directions. Um, uh, material can can uh, influence you as well as uh, I mean you you have an idea uh, 
you know, that it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of a background to understand what the material can do. But, you know, in a way, sometimes that naivete of not knowing what to do can make a person take a material to an extreme that otherwise it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't go to. C- can you give me an example in your work of how that happened? Um, <laughs> oh, man. Um, <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, man, I wish you'd asked me this a while ago. <laughs> well, no, I, I so think, I I mean, think the re- about reason I think about that. that is that I, I think about some pictures you showed me of, I think it was car radiators. Oh, right. right? Okay. Like, so, uh, so for instance, um, I was doing a, uh, symposium, a workshop out in Vermont and it was in the middle of winter. And, uh, you know, I, I went to try and be expressive and, and create art. And, um, of course, I went on an airplane, so I didn't have anything with me to take. But when I got there, I had to figure out what to do to create. And so I had talked to a few people because um, I was doing, as you said, in the constructivist side, found object art, where you use found objects to, to create a, a artistic piece. And they kind of directed me to uh, some snow banks <laughs> that I could dig under and find some things at. And um, I happened to be digging under a drift and just pulled some wood out from underneath. And it had been stuck through a radiator and the radiator tape came out with it, which the radiator tape is the the flues goes in between the flues that um, the air flows through in order to cool water. And it uh, was an interesting form, an interesting texture. And so um, I was like, okay, well, let's see what it is. So I started digging and pulled this thing out and it was a radiator. And I took it back to the shop and cut it into pieces and it took me in a whole nother direction. I did a whole um, four years body of work out of uh, that one experience so yes um, uh, I have and I've used those radiators to this point depending on how you cut them you can create different um, textures and they offer different forms Um, I do landscape works with them and, uh, Meaning that you take these radiators and it shapes like like rock formations I, and those yes, kinds of I things. Yes, I shape them into to, so that they look like rock formations and, uh, or landscapes in in a sense because they the the material itself lends itself to an uh, opportunity to um, kind of a micro macro opportunity where when you look at it it can take on many forms large or small. Um, because of its design, because of uh, its the way it's fabricated. And you, you mentioned that art in these sculptures have positive and negative spaces. I don't know what that means. I mean, I know what that means, but I don't know exactly how you re- – what does that well, mean? Well, positive is something that uh, you know, is a, exists, and negative is either the space surrounding it or the space within it. And so uh, positive and negatives is when you um, – so when you go out to a cliff face and there's an arc, the arc is the positive and the opening in between is the negative. And so if you so, think like like delicate arch, the symbol of Utah, exactly. the arch is the positive and the hole in between is the And the hole in the between negative. or the out exterior sky is the negative. Um, and it's the same with uh, just about anything. You have positives and negatives. Huh. So that's interesting. So you also talked about in some ways this – this utilitarian use for some of your art pieces. You showed us a picture of a, a huge smoker. Like that you right. built. Can you talk about that? Right. I thought that was interesting. Okay. This was a, uh, um, it was a, a sculpture that looks like a rock fall. So it has a larger kind of uh, pedestal leg. And then the rock fall is a continuation of rock, uh, rock forms or, or block forms that come off the side of it. And so it's basically like if you walk up to the side of a cliff face and a bunch of uh, or parts of the formations have fallen off and create a stack of material onto the sides of it. Well, this um, um, a person from North Carolina 
wanted a meat smoker, and uh, but he also enjoyed sculpture. And uh, I was doing a series called the Geometric Series, and it happened to be these kind of block forms. And he came to my studio, and he's like, well, how could we approach this? And um, I work in models, and so we, we took some of the model forms and, and started looking through them about how we could approach it. And we had to, of course you have certain requirements in order to create a smoker that you have to have. One of them is you have to be able to have an interior volume to it. The other is you need to be able to to build a fire next to it or in it so that you can uh, put the smoke into it where you do the meat. And the other is you have to figure out how to, uh, um, how to make it work, (laughs) the plumbing of it and, and that. Um, And so we studied up on how a smoker is built and what, what you need to do to make it uh, be successful. And after, uh, at a certain point, we were finally able to determine which shape was the, was the most purposeful shape. Uh, and it, it worked out really good. Uh, another thing is, is I've, I've had people ask me, you know, they liked the sculptures I've been doing and they wanted a barbecue. So you make the sculpture into a barbecue. Um, and that way, when it's closed, they have a nice piece of art. And uh, when they want a barbecue, they can open the piece of art up and, uh, and use it as a barbecue. I've made mailboxes that way many times or things like that. It's, it's really based upon the, um, the viewer or the person that, uh, you know, they, they want something interesting in their yard or in their business or uh, in as a public art piece that has a utilitarian aspect um, alongside of being a artwork. So what is the, was there something super odd that when someone said, you know, I'd like this, but I'd also like it to be a piece of art. And you said, yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, yes. I had a, um, one client commissioned me to do a wall piece for their home and they brought me a bicycle that he had, been riding when he was hit by a car and so the bicycle was totaled out and um all of the debris the residual debris that came with it he'd been in the hospital for like nine months and there was some kind of relationship that he had to this bicycle beforehand let alone uh, you know the damage that had happened from it and everything and they wanted it turned into a art piece and i i was kind of dumbfounded at first of how to approach it and how to uh, try and make it work. But when, as an artist, um, many times we are called problem solvers um, for different corporations, whether it's in film, whether it's for a a corporation that needs a bridge uh, to pass from their parking plaza into a tower, or um, whether it's a city that needs a, a bridge to cross the river. You know, there's uh, all different kinds of applications uh, for an artistic approach to it. And the artistic approach is just doing something original, imaginary, and different and uh, achieving a solution that uh, is needed by whoever the client is. Huh. So, you know, we, we're going to move into our first break. And as, as you know, uh, as people who listen to us know that we always ask our guests to choose some songs. And you talk about an artist that is eclectic and brings other influences. And one of those people, a song that you chose, is by Jean Baptiste, yep. who, who if you listen to his albums, y- you can have – all kinds of different musical styles. He's uh, an here. amazing artist. So the song you chose is a song called We Are by John Batiste, and it features the St. Augustine High School marching band. So can you tell us why you chose this song? Well, um, first of all, it's because um, he is a, an incredible artist himself, and he does what every artist does he tries to utilize all of those things around him that can help him to create a successful piece out of uh, of what it is he wants to create and um for instance he created a really great album called Wor- world music and uh this happens to be one of the hits off of it okay so this is we are by john baptiste featuring the saint augustine high school marching band from the fall on days when it's hard
That was We Are by John Baptiste in the St. Augustine High School Marching Band. You are listening to the Apex Radio Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91. I'll turn it back to you, Ryan. Thank you, Evan. So we were talking before the break about some of the commissions that you've had and kind of the interesting things that people have asked you to do and create. And it, it is this conversation about, you know, the, the, the old joke is, you know, you go home, you, the kid comes home from college and says, I've changed my major to art history or art. And it's like, well, geez, you know, you got to get a job, right? I mean, you're going to live in my basement forever. So, I mean, there is a, there is a commercial aspect. Mm-hmm. That, that, I mean, to, to, to be a working artist, you, you, you have to not only work, but you have to find ways to, to pay the bills, right? Yeah. So can yeah. you talk a little bit about this this kind of dichotomy between art for art's sake and then and the economics of being that of doing that? Okay. Uh, well, unless you're independently wealthy and uh, you don't have to worry about where your money comes from, um, it, you know the the old saying is "Don't give up your day job." And I mean, even many actors and actresses uh, hear the same story. And that's the same with sculptors and painters is we all have a second job and sometimes a third and a fourth um, because we um, we for art art or creation is a it's kind of a bad habit uh, that you get into. You want to create and in order to create you have to have a certain amount of money you have to have a place to do it uh, and that costs money and so so you do what you have to do to uh, to make it happen I for instance would uh, what I did is for many years um, when and this is when my wife and I both owned a gallery and we showed other artists the way I supported the gallery was by making furniture um, so I worked with a lot of designers and architects 
over the time and uh, um, making tables and chairs and things like that. And at a certain point, uh, because of uh, um, there was a point where I I kind of bagged off of the furniture because the artwork was doing better for me, and um, and then I delved into something I had done from college. From the point I was in college, is that I um, what I had done when I was in college is I worked in set construction, um, both for theater and in film. And um, that helped to, so I checked into a couple of job opportunities and uh, from a person that I met who was interested in my work and at the same time worked in film. And he was like, you know, we could really use you uh, on some of these productions. And so I kind of stepped from away from doing the furniture and I went a little bit more full time into making film. And the nice thing about doing the film work for me was that it allowed me I made a good enough money that I could leave my job and and film jobs are short they depending on what you're on if you're on a television series it's a different story if you're on a feature film it can be from a few weeks to a few months or less and what that did was set me up with the cash flow when I finished the job that I could go back to my studio and I could create what I wanted to create. And so, um, I, you know, I'm not suggesting that everybody go out and try and get a film job because first of all, it's not very easy to get. You have to be, have the right connections. And I was lucky and I stepped into it when I was in college and, and that was how I got into it. Um, but, um, you know, if you have something you love to do besides making art, then, then let that help support your bad habit. So you, you, you work in multiple mediums, right? Wood yeah. and stone and metal. Mm-hmm. How do you determine what medium you want to work in for a specific idea? Um, well, uh, it, it comes down to money. Um, wood for me is I can, you know, I can make uh, a lot of pieces that's lightweight. I can make them smaller and I can store them. Uh, when I work in steel, I have to, first of all, I have to have a shop. You got to have welder. You have to have all the tools to, the, it's, it requires a lot harder uh, and a higher number of tools um, to work in steel. And to work in stone, you have to have machinery um, because you need a crane or you need uh, ways of moving it because it's super heavy. And so the in a way, the material starts to define the way that you're working. So for me, for instance, I can work in wood and I can do smaller models. I do uh, models first and then I models are like sketches. And actually at this time in my life, I can make a model almost as fast as I can draw it. And a lot of times if I have, you know, if I can't get somebody to understand what I'm talking about, I can either draw it or make the model faster than I can explain it to them. Then I can find the words to explain it to them. So the model becomes a convenient thing for me because I can make a reality, make the idea into a reality. And then at a later point in time, if someone shows interest in it, I can scale it up and then I can go to whatever material they want to. It could be, the the nice thing is it depends on what you're, you're doing. So for instance, I could do it in styrofoam. I could take it to a foundry afterwards, have the molds made for it and cast it in bronze. I can make it in wood and after that, I can measure it out because I know what it is. And then I can have the pieces cut so that I can fabricate it in steel. Um, in stone, it's a little bit harder because stone is a material that you have to work with directly. And so, and the, the hard thing about stone is it's not a, what we call a plastic material. Plastic means that you can add to or subtract from it. And that's what's nice about wood and steel. And so if you make a mistake, mistake, you can repair it. But in stone, if you make a mistake, then you've got to determine a different way to go about it. So think about it. How many times do you think Michelangelo wanted to carve David? And he only wanted to do it once. <laughs> you know, so you have to, you have to kind of pre-plan, you know, what you're willing to do or what you're willing to go through to achieve the uh, end piece. You know, you talk about uh, with stone needing something to to lift 
over over their head. You know, I've actually seen Evan lift a Volkswagen Beetle over his head. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm sure it was one of those little model ones, so know. not, so not one of the true. big ones. Um, yeah. Let's talk about, for a minute, creativity, right? So obviously, you know, you, you have this idea, you have you know, t- to build the model. I mean, for you personally, as an artist and sculptor, where, where does creativity come from? Is it an internal thing? Is it inspired by external sources? How, how do you find that wellspring? Well, uh, I think actually creative is kind of in, innate in everyone um, has creative ideas because you, um, you know, you have an idea. I, I mean, somebody's telling you about something, you hear a story, you think that you can do it. And, and that's where the creativity starts to get enhanced is, oh, okay, so if I can do this, how do I do it? And uh, what can I, how, how do I achieve it? You know, if you want to jump your motorcycle across the Grand Canyon, how do you do it? And so you, this is where the creative aspect comes out. Now, there's uh, many different ways a person can be creative. You can be creative in numbers. You can be creative in science. You can be creative in all kinds of things. And that's what I think a lot of people don't understand about the arts is the arts can be applied to everything. It doesn't matter if it's just, it's not just music and it's not just um, sculpture or painting, dance or any of those things. I mean, there's many different directions creativity results i mean how do you think we got computers how do you think we got electronics you know it took someone with a creative mind and someone who wanted to sit down and and find a solution to what is a problem and that's where i said that artists are problem solvers and we create problems too yeah i mean i think that's interesting when you talk about the idea that that creativity is linked with discovery not just discovering of something new or exciting but but even discovery of new new worlds and new lands and new forms and and understanding how pieces can fit together that people didn't think they could fit together before. Mm-hmm. So on, on this campus, we, we have spent, uh, we're talking a lot about issues of, of overcoming anxiety and overcoming, and de- overcoming depression. So in your mind as an artist, is there a relationship or of anything about uh, in your life or in, in the discussions you've had about creativity and either uh, specifically suffering depression or overcoming anxiety? Well, I, I know that um, uh, when I, I I have anxieties and things too, and in, in a lot of different things. But when I am doing something creative, it distracts me from those anxieties. I would have to say in in many senses. But at the same time, it can create anxieties as well because when a person's being creative or, or creating something, they want to you know they want it to be good. And so, but but um, anxiety in a sense is created by the person within, and so um, you know it, a way, it can be a way of dealing with it, but it can also it can also add to it. You know, we were talking during the break uh, a minute ago about about the process that we're actually kind of going through here with this discussion and, and asking questions. And you mentioned something about uh, artists and motivations. Uh, can you explain what you're talking about there? Um, well, um, you, you, if you're motivated to create something, then you can uh, take those motivations to um, help direct you, uh, direct your energy away from other things and into um I, i'm not quite sure where you're going with it with the motivation but well this idea um, that that you had said that as we talk you're discovering like when oh, when you're doing right, an art right. pro, when, an, an art project like you're in, when, when you're producing something when you're creating something oftentimes you're not thinking about why. right the results you're not thinking about the results or why and then uh, you find in the process of making it, you discover things about yourself that you didn't realize before. Um, so, for instance, you you can uh, um, find that there was something that you found uh, interesting in your life, and all of a sudden it's becoming part of your expression um, in, in your ideas, or you see a result uh, that has more of a relationship to yourself as an individual and it motivates you to um to go and and to approach these same things over uh 
they, they can be a diff, it could be a difficult thing that you've been dealing with. It can, and the resulting thing uh, helps you to deal with that problem. And that's where the motivational side, I think, comes out of it that, that you're talking about. There's, it, you discover things about yourself when you're creating that you probably didn't know about yourself. Uh, beforehand. And a lot of times it's after you've made certain things and you step back and then you start to see how each one of them has a relationship to the other or to the next. And, um, and that's where it, it kind of, then it becomes a motivational thing because it drives you to want to do more because you're discovering things about yourself that you didn't know. So, you know, you've talked about doing, doing series like the pod series or deconstruction series. So, what you're saying is, is that somehow as you look back, you can see how all of these different series of artworks are connected and building on or off of one another or off of experiences that I had or, or, um, things that I had done. So for instance, the deconstruction series was, uh, and I didn't really even realize why I had approached it until later I was working on a larger piece for um, for the redevelopment agency of Salt Lake and Salt Lake City and it's a large engineered piece that's 20 feet by 20 feet and all the components in it are a uh, bridge component and when I was building it um, I realized that the motivation to build that piece had come out of a, a tragedy that all of us experienced, which was the collapse of the World Trade Centers. And there was this strange, innate beauty of the debris sticking out of the ground from that that inspired me to create those pieces. And that's like a very strange relationship that... Uh, that I discovered after, um, after I'd already done, done the series of work. And it was like three years later when I was doing the larger commission for the city that, that it became, uh, apparent. So, me. so in that regard, what, what is something that you've thought about trying or doing or experimenting with artistically that you haven't done yet? <laughs> well, um, oh, I mean, that's a- I mean, your, your wish list, your, your wish list, uh, if you will. My wish list of stuff. Uh, well, you know, I, I really like to work big. I've, I've done large bridges and things like that, but I'd like, I'd like um, for some of these artworks to become architectural pieces uh, where it was, uh, you know, similar to... Um, I can't think of his name right now, but he did the uh, Guggenheim Bilbao or in Prague, there's what they call the uh, Fred and Ginger house. Uh, um, it's, uh, um, it's where you're creating, uh, taking a sculpture and turning it into a museum. Um, look at Suma, for instance, that's a very sculptural, uh, architectural object. And I think that's, you know, a, a direction I'd like to go. Although it doesn't have to be architectural. I, I'd be happy to, to do a nice giant piece out in the middle of the great salt lake desert. You know? <laughs> so, so in that regard, what, what would you tell a young Cordell Taylor? Who's just starting this journey now? It's, um, um, don't let go of your dreams and, uh, always know that each piece you make is a step towards the, the end result of your body of work of what you will become. You know, uh, don't, don't be a, af- well, maybe be afraid of the moment, but don't be afraid of the future, you know, because you is, like I said, it's each, uh, each piece you make drives the next piece and you can't be where you are or where you got without having been where you were. So you have to, you have to take a step forward. I, I love what you just said about be afraid of the moment, but don't be afraid of the future. Right. Yeah. I think that's interesting. So with that, let's move into our next break. Uh, This is a song that you chose called Why by a band that I kind of grew up with a little bit, Bronski Beat. Maybe you could tell us a little bit why you chose this song. Um, Well, it was always a a song that I found inspirational because at the time that it was made, it was really um, a cutting edge uh, song. 
they were kind of a crossover from disco to new wave to uh, modern rock. And, and Bronski Beat was, I mean, they were great. Great. Of course, I grew up in the disco era. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, let's go. This is Why by Bronski Beat. Tell me why. That was Why by Bronski B, and you are listening to the Apex Radio Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. I'll turn it back to you, Ryan. Thanks, Evan. So uh, we, we were talking to the break. By the way, if you liked Why by Bronski Beat, you suggested Cordell, Small Town Boy is another Bronski Beat song that, uh, that people It is. Like. That's another good one. But why is always a great question. <laughs> yeah. It's been something that's driven me my whole life, so... That so one of the let's talk about, uh, as we move into this last segment here, uh, about um, your film and TV work. 
Uh-huh. So you, you've not only done art pieces, but you mentioned earlier that you got into other things uh, film-wise. That helped kind of fund your art habit, I mm-hmm. guess, is what you could say. So let's talk about uh, some of the things you've done, films, TV, and some of the things you've done for them. Okay, well, um, so uh, if any of you guys have seen Napoleon Dynamite, um, the um, the director who did Napoleon Dynamite, he did another film called Gentleman Broncos, which is about uh, a young um, author who had been writing from his childhood and um, uh, had gone to a workshop, and another author stole his story. Uh, another who was a more famous author stole his story, and then... Um, created a a story out of it and got super famous over it and it's a very strange story because it's kind of a futuristic story and so they but it's set in a steampunk era kind of look of where you use 50s technology mixed with contemporary um, ray guns and things like that and so I was asked to design um, different parts for this so-called war that they had in it uh, um, ray guns and things like that and I designed them out of um, old pneumatic drills and chisels and uh, gas parts for like gas meters and things like that along with uh, um, different kinds of tubings and uh, modern electronic things that we added and even microscopes the microscopes were the scopes or motorcycle throttles were the uh, the handle grips and things for them and um, uh, some of them were large scale howitzers and things like that and then so uh, as I designed some of the weaponry and that then they took the weaponry uh, the larger weaponry and turned them into model scale in order to um, do certain scenes with them. So in that scenario, do they do they just say, hey, we want you to design these ray guns? Or does somebody give you an idea of what they should look like? You, or do you, you just talk with, uh, well, there are several people who are involved in it, um, um, both the uh, writer, of course, and then the, um, the producer or the director of it, and because they have a, a vision of what it is they want um, for these things. And then you try to fulfill that vision because there's so many different ways you could go. So we were creating like base laboratories and um, we were what we were doing was trying to bring technology through low, low tech items like washing machines and dryers. Um, that that became fireplaces and things inside of caves um, and science labs that were made out of egg cartons. Yeah, I mean, the it was all about the textures and things to create this modern kind of science futuristic thing um, and keep it in a st- steampunk manageable way for people to understand it. What what is some what what's some amazing things that you've seen? I mean, in, in building films that that you 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 start with an empty studio or an empty warehouse and it's transformed. What are some of those cool transformations? Well, we have, we have built. Uh, so I was working on for Disney for uh, for the last four seasons doing High School Musical, and so for instance, we have the entire East High School up in Salt Lake built inside of a studio. Um, in other films, we've done caves. We uh, on 127 hours um, with James Franco, we built five canyons inside of uh, the Granite Furniture Building in Salt Lake, um, so that we could film and we could control uh, different aspects of filming um, of this guy that was trapped in Blue John Canyon over by Moab and had to cut his arm off with a pocket knife, and he was trapped. Uh, by this rock for 127 hours. Um, so the the requirements are really based upon whatever the story is. Um, for Evil Angel, I did so I, I'm, I build the gimbals for train crashes and different kinds of things. So for um, this one, uh, it was a rolling hallway that was a 
uh, basically a 10 foot by 10 foot by 30 foot long hallway that this demon could chase a girl down through the hallway and the demon would run up the walls and across the ceiling and down the other wall as he was chasing the girl down the hallway. It was quite a trick to, uh, to make all of it happen uh, because you have to figure out the mechanics of how it's done, the materials of how to put it together, and then you have to make it happen. Um, another one was a cross. Uh, this guy climbs out on the cross. It's on the side of a building, uh, a 30 story building and the cross collapses. And so I have to have to be able to make it where, um, first of all, that he can do it without getting killed. And second of all, that we can recover it so that, um, we have, if we have to reset to reshoot it. Um, so there's a lot of different aspects you have to take in, but the majority of the time, what I'm building is sets, um, which are rooms and things like that. So we, we should mention that if, if you want to know more about the film and TV work of, of Cordell Taylor, you can, you've got an IMBD, IMDB, IMDB which page. is the internet movie database dot IMDB.com. And you type in Cordell Taylor and a photo of me in front of a yellow van comes up. You click on it and then it'll show you a biography of uh, different different films. Um, so um, I've been fortunate and, and I've worked on a lot of uh, really, really fun films and really great with a lot of really great actors and directors. And great. Cool. So let's move into our, our final break. This is a song by Amy Winehouse called Back to Black. Can you tell us why you chose that? Um, it's about drug addiction. And drug addiction is uh, takes many artists out of, uh, out of, you know, away from us. And she's one of them that we lost that was a, a master. Okay. This is Back to Black by Amy Winehouse.
That was Back to Black by Amy Winehouse, and you are listening to the Apex Radio Hour here on KSUU, Thunder 91.1. I'll turn it back to you, Ryan. Thank you, uh, Evan. So we're at the last part of our, our program, which we always <coughs> excuse me, end with the, the question about joy. So I'll start with you. Uh, Cordell Taylor, what are you currently watching, reading, listening to, or playing that is bringing you joy? Um, well... You know, the sad part is about working in television and on film. The last thing you want to do when you go home is watch some television program. Uh, so, um, but what my wife and I do is uh, we actually, because uh, especially since libraries are kind of under threat right now, um, we're fortunate that we have one of the best film collections that there is at uh, in the Salt Lake public library system and so we um we go and we challenge ourselves to uh watch uh, some really great uh, mysteries series uh um different kinds of international films and things like that and so we uh, spend a lot of time doing that the other thing is is i like to travel and i like to um it, it doesn't matter where it's at I like to explore, and those are the things that really uh, make me the happiest. Great. Thank you. Evan Miller, what are you currently watching, reading, listening to, or playing that is bringing you joy? Yes. So recently, I haven't had a ton of time just because of studying and, and work and things like that, but the other day... Whoa, what's things like that? Things like... Oh, and as well as uh, I have a, a new fiance, and so... That uh, we've spent a lot of time together and, and whatnot. So, um, but with that, we've done a, a game night recently where we had some friends over and we played some games. Um, a game that was particularly fun was uh, called Secret Hitler. I don't know if you guys have heard of that one, but it is basically a, a, everyone has roles on a card, and then um, there's basically two teams, and then you you it's a game of of debate and argument, and you vote people off basically. But that was a lot of fun. So you rub them off. Is that what you said? You, you, uh, vote, you vote them, them off. off. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And uh, Ryan, what is what are you watching, listening to, reading, or playing that is bringing you joy? I am, uh, we recently switched vehicles, my wife and I, and I have the one that has uh, Sirius XM Radio, oh. a big listener of, of radio and music, and I have turned the dial and set it to the 40s Junction Station, and I've been listening to a lot of 40s music and it, it just nice. in a day of where i normally listen to npr and other kinds of news having that kind of music on is just exciting i got in the car this morning as i was prepared to start to teach early this morning and the song was it's only a paper moon oh, by nat Frank's king cole, and, oh, nat king cole which is one of my absolute favorite songs it's just a great <laughs> yeah. way to start the day so it's only a paper moon by nat king cole so with that we'd like to thank cordell taylor uh, as our guest here and thank you for being here at suu yeah. thanks to evan miller uh, for this, we miss our producer, Sophie, who's out at doing some other things. And we're going to end with a song that I've actually really, really come to like since you suggested it. You'll love is, this band. They are super. Yeah. You, you Only Love Me by Devochka. Can you give us a quick Devochka yeah. lesson? Devochka. It's uh, D-V. It's like devotion. Devochka. Um, it's a Czech, Czech word. So. Okay. So You Only Love Me by Devochka. Uh, on the Apex Radio Hour. Thanks. We'll see you later. Mm-hmm.